Isaac is a Palestinian Christian pastor and a theologian. He now pastors the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem and the Lutheran Church in Beit Sahor. He is also the academic dean of Bethlehem Bible College and is the director of the highly acclaimed and influential Christ at the Checkpoint Conferences. Munther is passionate about issues related to Palestinian theology. He speaks locally and internationally and has published numerous articles on issues related to the theology of the land, Palestinian Christians and Palestinian theology, holistic mission and reconciliation. He is the author of The Other Side of the Wall, From Lands to Lands, From Eden to the Renewed Earth, An Introduction to Palestinian Theology. All of that written in Arabic. So you may have to speak in tongues and get a translation to read that. But you got him here and he gonna talk to you in English today. Uh, so you don't even got to go buy that book. But I'm just giving you, he's an author, he's a scholar, commentary in the book of Daniel. And most recently has published a book on women ordination in the church. Come on, somebody, and clap your hands for that. Amen. He is also involved in many reconciliation and interfaith forums. He is a Kairos Palestine board member. He studied civil engineering in Berzet University, hopefully I say that right, in Palestine, then obtained a master in biblical studies from Westminster Theological Seminary and a PhD, my God today, from the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. Munther is married to Radina, and, who is an architect. All right, building things, structuring things. Building a home and a liberation movement. Somebody say amen. Together they have two boys. Certainly want to also shout out Fazna and all of those that have hit a bill and everyone that's helped to make this possible. But I'm going to invite you now to stand to your feet and let us prepare to receive the spokesperson for the King of Glory today. He is our brother. He is our friend. He is our leader, a unique leader in this moment. As Dr. Mark Laberton stated, who knew six months ago that his voice would be needed so much and so powerfully for all of us in a time as this. Let us welcome Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac as he comes to preach to us the word of God. Thank you, thank you. Well, what a wonderful joy and privilege to be here with you. It feels special. Actually, I'm very emotional now. I hope I don't mess this up. Um, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for your courage for speaking for Palestine. And I know I am in one of the leading vo churches, you know, in a time when we felt unheard. This is one of the most churches, probably in the universe, that stood with the side uh, of Palestinians. Thank you, uh, Pastor Mike, for your leadership, for your courage. Thank you for the community of the way. That's why I'm really honored to be with you uh, this morning. And I must also say thank you to the Friends of Sabil who uh, sponsored this trip. Um, Please get to know more about Friends uh, of Sabil, uh, which was actually founded uh, to uh, support the work of Sabil in Jerusalem, founded by Palestinian liberation theologian uh, Naim Atik, who was partially, if not hugely, inspired by many African-American theologians uh, as well. So we must acknowledge that. This morning, we're here to worship God and to learn from the word of God. <laughs> Back home, I'm used to preaching for 15 minutes. <laughs> Pastor Mike said, we'll Pentecostal go as much as you want. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> what I'm going to do is going to take you uh, in a journey from the Bible to today. We're going to go from biblical times into our day, especially into Gaza, and then back to biblical times. And to do so, I chose one of the, really my favorite passages in all of Scripture, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, and I'd like to read it from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But that expert in the law wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, the famous story, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed, on, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for the extra, any extra expense you might have. Jesus then continues, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. As I said, this is one of my favorite passages in scriptures. And I hope today that we go on a journey 2,000 years ago to Palestine to understand what was really happening and what Jesus was saying. But then that you will be able to come with me 2,000 years forward to see why this story still speaks to our world even maybe in a stronger way today. The story began with a teacher of the law, probably the modern equivalent someone with an MDiv degree this is someone who knows his stuff. And he approached Jesus and asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is by no means an innocent question. It's not as if he wanted to know how to go to heaven. This is a teacher of the law, friends. This is a guy who knows everything. In fact, the Bible says he was asking to test Jesus. He wanted to know, how does Jesus answer this question to determine which religious group Jesus belongs to? which denomination, which theological side Jesus belongs to. He was testing Jesus. He wanted to know where he stands. Is he one of us? Or he answers in a different way, he's one of them. This is the nature of the question. It would be like asking a priest in Europe uh, in the time of the Reformation whether a person is saved by faith or works. This is the kind of question. So the discussion led into the conclusion that we all know loving God and loving the neighbor are the real requirements to inherit eternal life. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart or your soul or your strength or your mind and then your neighbor as yourself. Jesus actually approved that answer and if anything we know, what if Jesus would add anything to that, he would say that loving one's neighbor is equal to loving God. The two are the same actually, Jesus said in Matthew. So Jesus challenged the person and he said, go and do likewise. In other words, it's not simply about knowing, it's about doing. It's about what we do, it's about doing it. So many times, by the way, we say all the right things, but don't do them. So at this, Jesus diffused the teacher of the law. And then the Bible says this teacher wanted to justify himself so he asked another seemingly innocent question. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And this is where things become interesting. So let's think, what is this lawyer really asking? What is behind the question, who is my neighbor? See, what he's doing is as if drawing a circle around himself. And he's asking Jesus, who is in the circle, a neighbor, and who is outside of the circle, not necessarily a neighbor. It's not an innocent question at all. 
it actually assumes that there are those who we should not consider as neighbors. By this question, the teacher of the law was seeking to draw a circle around himself, and he wanted to ask Jesus, where do I draw this circle? Who is inside so that I can be sure to love them? And who is outside so I can be free of my obligation to love them? Who is with us and who is against us? It's a typical way of dividing the world as us versus them. And as Jesus said, we're all good at loving those who look like us. In many cases, who believe like us, who are part of our group. This is really what's behind that question. Who's with us and who is with them? These are the ideologies and policies of supremacy, my friend. Who's my neighbor? Who are the good ones? These are ideologies of privilege, of entitlement, that sadly still dominate our world. This way of thinking begins by drawing lines to divide and distinguish us from one another based on religion, maybe denomination, maybe ideology, maybe nationality, political affiliation, color of the skin, or race. We love to draw these lines. Then we separate from those who are different than us and refuse to engage with them because they are different. And in some cases, we say we are better. This leads to rejecting others, to dehumanizing others, maybe even demonizing them, and finally justifying violence against the people and giving it righteous names. Self-defense, bringing democracy, it's the war on Iraq. Law and order, right? You justify violence to those who are different than you. And friends, for years I have been saying, this is precisely the story of Gaza. How else do you justify? How else can you explain? Besieging two million people in the world's biggest open air prison. All of this before October 7. Controlling even and deciding controlling the amount of calories that entered Gaza. This is how dehumanizing the siege was. For 16 years, Gaza was under this brutal siege. And the fact that the world was okay with this siege makes it easier to understand how the world is okay today with the genocide against the same people of Gaza. Because we created walls of separation. And we labeled them as terrorists. And that labeling, because they're not like us. And this is why I said, if you watch my Christmas homily, I wish we had different color skin. I wish we had colored eyes. Maybe they would have felt pity on us. But once they separated us and created this wall and then labeled us, dehumanized us, it became okay to bomb us and then blame us for it. And this is the kind of thing we're going through right now. This is Gaza before the war, and this is Gaza right now. To the extent that the whole world is watching a genocide unfold in front of our eyes, and we're still rationalizing and debating and doing nothing. This war has convinced us more than anything that many in the world do not see us as equals. Given that they continue to justify the killing of our children. As I think of the systematic dehumanization of Palestinians over the years to the extent that even the killing of 16,000 children is not enough. They raise concerns and then they send weapons. This is what's happening right now in Palestine. They do not see us as equals. This is the art of labeling. Let me just give you one clear example. One, one example would be enough. You know, everybody is outraged by what happened on October 7. And let me highlight one element of October 7, the kidnapping of people. I hope we all agree that kidnapping people is wrong. And I hope we all agree that kidnapping children is evil. And I want everybody to be released. I hope we all agree on this. Do you know that since October 7th, 
9,000 Palestinians have been kidnapped. 9,000. Why isn't anybody doing anything about it? Why isn't anybody talking about it? Those Palestinians kidnapped are tortured, starved, raped. It's documented now. It's no, it's no longer allegations that they are raped. Raped in prison. They are held without charges. They don't see lawyers, administrative detention. I haven't seen the Palestinian flag on big monuments. I haven't seen countries waging war on Israel to release these hostages. You know why? Because this is the art of labeling, dehumanizing. They're not neighbors. They're not neighbors, they're terrorists. Once you label them as terrorists, the terminology changes and what? They're arrested for security. This is the empire at play, controlling and determining labels. It's been 10 months and we're still pleading for a ceasefire, 10 months and we're still pleading for the world to humanize Palestinians. Because we live in a world in which we do not consider those who are different than us as our neighbors using the words of Jesus. And of course, we Christians, though we do not like to admit it, are just as guilty of this labeling and divisiveness. Our history, sadly, and our present is full of this mentality of prejudice, entitlement of us versus them. We always think we're better than others. Even though, by the way, we claim we're saved by grace, right? Not of anything of our own, yet act as if we've earned it and as if we're better than everybody else. This is what shocks me in our Christian way. And sadly, this war as well, we've seen Christians justify this war, even supporting it. We've heard Christians calling for Israel to turn Gaza into a parking lot. I'm talking about preachers, friends. And imagine when we are concerned about our loved ones and see preachers who are supposed to teach about the love of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, say, turn Gaza into a parking lot. We've seen a congressman who studied in prestigious evangelical seminaries, two of them, who was a pastor before he became a congressman, say, let's get it over with quickly and do what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the fact that he thinks of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as good examples, in which we entire people, you know, were, were wiped away, and we think this is a good example, is what shocks us. Where is Jesus? Where is the commandment to love? which is the DNA of our Christian yes. faith. Yes. All of this began with the description of our land as an empty land, a land without people, we were told, for a people without a land. When you look at our land and see it as a land without people, this is again the art of dehumanizing Palestinians. They don't see us. We've been erased from the very beginning when our land was described a land without people people and then we're simply supposed to accept we were it was imposed on us this colonial theology that God gave our land to someone else you know many times when people talk about Christian Zionism I keep saying I wish Christian Zionists listen to themselves and see what they're saying I, I wish they see the things from our eyes you know because in essence what you are uh, telling us is that, you know, if there is a dispute, show me one other dispute all over the world in which the reference point to solving that dispute uh, is not the law or the international law, but a sacred text. And how am I supposed to continue any conversation with you when your side of the story is, well, God told me so. But this is what was imposed on us. And it comes from position of power and privilege. God is on our side. He gave us the land or he gave them the land. Just accept it. Because it's if we're less human. That's why, by the way, we've been saying Christian Zionism is about a tribal racist God. Don't convince me otherwise. Who privileges people. They're more entitled. They can get more rights. And if anything, when we complain, we are to blame. Jesus answers, as I told you, we'll be jumping back from the Bible to today. Who is my neighbor was the question. Because we always love to draw lines. And I love Jesus' answer. Um, an answer that continues to challenge me, and I hope it challenges us today. 
And of course, rather than listing 10 points by which we can determine who is a neighbor and who is not, a typical evangelical way, 10 points and a book. In a typical Jesus fashion, he tells a story. And let's think about it. The story is the parable of the good Samaritan. And I think if we don't pay careful attention to many details in the story, we miss the entire point. A man was traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem, was attacked and dropped on the way. He was left in the middle of the street in need of help. And then we discover that those who did not help him were actually religious people. It's really important. Why did these two religious people who passed by this man chose not to stop? Have you asked yourself this question? Could it be because they were too busy? Or maybe, as I always say, they were probably on their way to a Christian conference, perhaps on mission or worship. That's why they didn't stop. They were too busy. Or maybe they were doing something religious. Maybe they were concerned that if this man was actually dead, then touching him would defile them according to the law. So they were more concerned about religiosity more than they are about the person himself. And I think Jesus intentionally, and this is the point of the story, it's those religious leaders who did not help. The apathy and indifference of the church is a serious, serious matter. And the silence in the face of injustice should continue to trouble us, especially in the prophetic tradition. Silence is complicity, especially when the genocide is being broadcast live to all to see. Silence is complicity when that very same genocide is endorsed by those who use our own sacred text, we can't be silent. If they use the Bible to justify the killing of children and we're silent, that means we're okay with it. And silence is complicity, and please accept my honesty, especially when the genocide is being carried over using your money, your tax money. And especially when that genocide is happening, given a political cover by those you elected. If you're silent, that means you're okay with their choices. If you're silent, you're okay. it means you're okay with the way money is spent. And we can't be indifferent to what's happening in our world. As I said, especially when it's happening in the name of religion. Sorry to jump from one story to the other. I've been really challenged recently by uh, something I saw in the parable, another story Jesus gave, uh, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. You know, the rich man who, you know, the story, one went to heaven, one went to hell, one was rich, one was poor. And I always wonder what was the problem with the rich man? It can't be that he was rich. And the story doesn't say much about why did he go to hell? Until I saw something in the story which says that Lazarus laid at the gate of the rich man. Which means that the rich man would see Lazarus in his poverty and pain every day going in and going out and he did nothing. The sin is apathy. It's indifference. And we can't be true followers of Jesus and not care for those around us. <laughs> Friend, this is Matthew 25 all over. Matthew 25 tells us that Jesus will, that God will judge us based on how we treated the least of these. Yes. Right? Who are the least of these? Those who are, who are hungry, thirsty, naked, prisoners, strangers. Yes. In other words, those who are victims of structures of injustice. Yes. Otherwise, there should be no, no one who is hungry if there is justice. So victims of injustice. And Jesus says, you will be judged. We will be judged based on how we treated the least of these. 
I wish we take Jesus seriously. And I wish we evangelicals take this passage literally and not other passages. You know, we love to take the Bible literally all the time. I wish you take this one literally. It's a challenge to all of us. And you know, when you think how the church completely sometimes misses or ignores purposefully or not these commandments, I'm shocked. I love how uh, one commentator put it about Matthew 25. He looks at the way Christians respond to injustice and, and in, in, in contrast to what Jesus says in Matthew 25, he says, this is how Christians respond today. They read this passage as if it was saying, I was hungry and you formed a humanities group to discuss my hunger. I was imprisoned and you crept off quietly to your chapel and pray for my release. I was naked and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick and you knelt and thanked God for your health. I was homeless and you preached to me the spiritual love of God. I was lonely and you left me alone to pray for me. You seem to be holy, so close to God, but I am still very hungry and lonely and cold, unquote. This is written by John Stott, by the way. And when I look at what's happening in Gaza today, it's the same. I was under siege and you wrote a statement. This is how the church responds today. I was under siege, I was going through a genocide and you prayed for peace. This is how the church today is complicit. And by the way, it looks nice to pray for peace. It looks righteous, it looks pious. Is this what God is calling us? Is this the kind of solidarity with the oppressed and the marginalized that God calls us for? And it's not only that, as I always say, it's not just about helping others, it's about seeing the image of Jesus in others. Whatever you have done to the least of these, you have done to me. You have done to me, Jesus says. This was one of the main reasons behind, this was one of the main inspirations behind the Christ under the rubble manger, Shamsir, many of you have seen. In a time when the whole world continued to rationalize and justify, even blame the people of Gaza for the killing of the children of Gaza, we insisted we see, Jesus in, we see Jesus in every child pulled from under the rubble. We were traumatized and angry from the systematic dehumanization of the Palestinians and of Palestinian children to the extent that people were okay with this number of children being killed on a daily basis under our watch and not do a thing. That's why I said, we see Jesus in them. Jesus is under the rubble today in Gaza. Are they neighbors in Jesus' words in the parable of the good Samaritans, when people did not see them as equal or as neighbors, we saw Jesus in them. So let's jump back 2,000 years ago. And I told you we'll be jumping to the text and to today's world, just to see the similarities. Jesus answers the question and gives the story, as I said. And first detail is that it was religious people who did not help, right? And second, we look at the person who was victimized, and the Bible says, Jesus says, he fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. So this man was left both naked and unconscious. As a result, the two religious people could not detect from his accent where he was from, and he was not dressed, so his clothes further could not disclose his identity. Do you get the point what's happening here? In other words, it's hard to determine their nationality or religion. He was a human being. All of us are equal, born in the image of God. And I wonder if this was the reason why the two religious people who passed by him did not stop to help. They couldn't determine, is he one of us? Or one of them. If he was one of us, we would have acted. Sanctions and siege to rescue them. If he's not one of us, we blame them. This is precisely what's happening in our world today. 
This is so troubling. It's a big, big challenge to all of us who are part of traditions which exist to help navigate right from wrong based on doctrine and dogma and the right belief, the true theology. And Jesus here tells us it's about loving the neighbor. So remember the question, where do I draw the lines? Jesus comes and removes these lines. There are no circle. There is no circle. There is no us and them when it comes to defining the neighbor. Everyone is a neighbor. Everyone is a neighbor. And we are called by God to love them as ourselves. It's a calling. It's not a matter of choice. We cannot pick and choose our neighbors. We cannot pick and choose whom we love. And then this was not only, this was not the only way, I believe, in the parable in which Jesus reveals our prejudice. Because there is another powerful element at play here. Who was it that helped the wounded person? Who was it? A Samaritan. And maybe again, because we're 2,000 years removed from the original context, we could miss the point. Because 2,000 years ago, such a story would have been a real shock to its hearers. Samaritans were despised and hated by the Jews of the time. They were not considered pure. And of course, the feeling was mutual. A Jew could not even walk in a Samaritan area because they considered them unholy. In fact, in John 8, we read that Samaritans were regarded as demon-possessed. This is how people looked at them. When I say demonized, it's precisely that. And in Luke 9, the disciples offered a very practical solution to the problem of the Samaritans. Do you know what they said? What's the solution? They suggested to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? How similar it is to what we read and see today from politicians and leaders. Send them to Gaza. I said, best send them to Gaza. To the people of, send them to Egypt, I mean, sorry. They tell us, send them to Egypt. Or create a space in the desert for them. Or get it over with quickly. Send a nuclear bomb to Gaza. It was suggested by Israelis and Americans. Turn Gaza into a parking lot. It's the same exact mentality. They don't see us as humans. Send fire to consume them. This is how people thought of the Samaritans. So when Jesus mentions a Samaritan... As the hero of the story, it's like a shock before the audience. The villain, according to our natural tendencies and our natural perceptions, is actually the hero of the story. The so-called evil one is, in fact, the one who shows radical mercy. And so here is my suggestion today. Let us try reading the story in a different context by replacing the word Samaritan with a people group we have demonized and rejected. Imagine reading the story in such a way. Imagine if we say it that it was a Muslim from Gaza who helped the wounded person. It would be intriguing, right? Could you imagine what would happen if Jesus were to tell the story uh, in a place, I don't know, like Alabama today and say, or Texas and say, a Muslim from Gaza while traveling came near, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. This is what Jesus was doing. He was bringing back not just the humanity, elevating those we demonized. If Jesus was telling the story in Alabama during the times of segregation, he would have said, and a black person stopped and helped the white man after white pastors walked by him and did nothing. Jesus here is challenging our prejudice, challenging the way we look at the others. Friends, it's time to begin treating one another as neighbors in the words of Jesus. It's so sad to live in a world when there is so much religiosity, yet so little concern for justice and humanity. It's really shocking. One of the biggest indictments of the church today is our indifference and apathy. 
the person who asked the question, who is my neighbor? And the two men in the story who passed by the victim were actually religious. By the way, this is why, and it breaks my heart. You know how many people during this war came to me and said, we stopped going to church after Gaza? Because the church doesn't care. They don't talk about Gaza. They don't pray about Gaza. Where was the church is a question I keep asking. This is indeed a lament. A lament by Jesus about us religious people, people who are concerned about the right theology and right interpretation only to become indifferent to the suffering of those around us. I really see Jesus lamenting in the story. Let's remember the word of Jesus. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Who is my neighbor? And unless we begin to break down those barriers between us and people who are different than us, unless we as Christians break down the barriers between themselves and people of other faiths and see them as neighbors, defend, love, and rescue them, even allow them to do the same for us, we cannot be true disciples and be able to witness effectively to those around us. It's time we break down these barriers. Pastor Mike, I'm really excited I'm here in an African-American church, and I mean this. And I've made it a priority in these years to build more stronger bridges with African-Americans. Because you're right, there is a lot of commonalities between us. Uh, it's not just the tear God experience. You know, um, I had the honor of visiting the George Floyd Square while in Minneapolis. It's a very moving pilgrimage that you could do there and learn about the story, but the whole struggle against uh, the systematic injustice African Americans still go through today. And I was struck by the many similarities between us. I mean, even the way in which George Floyd was murdered is a typical way in which Israeli soldiers arrest Palestinians even today. When that happened, so many posters circulated on, jo on social media showing the comparison between how Palestinians are arrested, you know, putting your knee on the neck of the victim and what happened to George Floyd. And in fact, I was told there that Minneapolis police was trained by the Israeli military. We understand the depth of this systematic injustice and the racism behind it. We know what it means to be on the other side of prejudice and supremacy. We understand what segregation means. And in Palestine today, we live under a system of apartheid. I will name it. I will not shy away from it. The A word, as they call it, it's apartheid. It's proven, it's documented. We don't have to even discuss it. It shocks me, by the way. And again, this is part of the racism I'm talking about. It shocks me because when international human rights organizations give reports, everyone celebrates them and thank them and thank their courage. Yet, in the case of Palestine, we have Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the leading human rights organizations, numerous UN reports. Before that, the leading Israeli human rights organizations, Beth Salem, Yeshdins, and others. And before that, the Palestinian human rights organizations and experts. We all said it's apartheid. Of course, when Palestinians say it, no one listens because of prejudice. And then Israelis said it, and people began to pay attention. Then the international community said it. You know who's not using the word apartheid? It's the church. And it's why. Why? The international law applies on everyone with the exception of Palestinians. You celebrate these reports, but when they speak about Palestine, you're silent. And I, I told many, many church leaders, if you're not going to call it apartheid, you should go now in public and call for the closure of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Why do they exist if you're not going to listen to them? And by the way, in the same way, someone like the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu celebrated all over the world, a good friend of Sabil, by the way. Yet when he says there is apartheid in Palestine, everyone ignores him. No one wants to listen. 
And again, it makes us wonder, are we less humans as Palestinians? Why isn't anybody talking about the systematic injustice we're going through? Let's name it. And we as Palestinian Christians and African Americans also both know what it means for the Bible to be weaponized against us. Slavery was, you know, justified by the Bible. Apartheid in South Africa was justified by the Bible. Both of us stood firm in our faith. And both of us held true to the radical love and holding firm to the truth uh, and not compromising the truth while committing to non just to nonviolence. There is a lot of commonalities between us. There is a lot to do when it comes to working together as Palestinian Christians and African Americans. Because we both know what it means not to be considered a neighbor, yet responds by speaking truth to power and doing it in love. And for that matter, it's also time not just to name apartheid, but to name Zionism as racism. Zionism, Zionism as a form of supremacy. You don't believe me? Read what the Zionists are saying. Let's read the nation state law passed by the Israeli parliament, the Knesset. This is in the, in the Israeli, they voted for this. In the nation state law, they say, the right for self-determination is exclusive to the Jewish people only. If that is not supremacy, what is? So when I say Zionism is supremacy, I'm not just making allegations. I'm telling you what Zionism is in theory and practice. I could speak for hours about the denial of our rights as Palestinians and the privileged Jewish Israelis who live in our land on even on the Palestinian territories enjoy over against our rights. The current Israeli government which was formed in January of 2023, said in its opening manifesto when they signed the coalition, and I quote, the land of Israel, or sorry, uh, Jews have an exclusive right to the land of Israel, end quote. Jews have an exclusive right to the land. If this is not supremacy, I don't know what is. So it's time to name things for what they are. And it's time to begin listening to the Palestinians and our plights, and it's time to be in solidarity. Costly and active solidarity. Because words of, you know, prayers and concerns, they're good. We appreciate your prayers. But we're asking for more, especially in times like these. Prayer is a form of activism. It must, must be always accompanied with activism. This is why I want to go back to the biblical text for our conclusion. How did the discussion with Jesus and the teacher of the law conclude? It concluded with Jesus telling the teacher of the law, listen to this, do this and you shall live. Do likewise. Do likewise. Remember how the story started. It was a question about the right theology. How does Jesus answer determines which group he belongs to? And how does Jesus answer? It's about what you do. It's about the right practice. This is why we say active and costly solidarity. For the right theology should always lead us to the right path, the right practice. Our faith is about doing. So love your neighbor as yourself. Do it, and I pray to do it. I hope and pray to do today that the world continues to see the Palestinians as neighbors as we will continue to plead with the world for a ceasefire in Gaza and justice for Palestinians. Thank you. <laughs>